Drama 2. Ring, ring, ring. The call has come out in the trauma center. The page. Trooper, one priority. NBC, 10 minutes up and 16 minutes back. The GO team is on board. Preparation. Tell me what you need to do as a radiographer to prepare for this trauma patient. What does the radiographer need? What supplies? A portable x-ray machine, a fully charged detector with a backup battery, positioning sponges, tape, gloves, isolation gown, shoe covers, wrap bags, wipes, pen and paper, or blank folder form, but last but not least, everything you have ever learned in x-ray school. Some things to ponder. You need to imagine a situation where your x-ray will determine the patient's future. This could be life or death for the patient. The staff all work closely as a team and communication is important. You need to be at your best. You need to be precise and efficient. You need to perform the best quality x-rays possible. There is no time for error. So much goes on before the patient arrives. Beware. Emergency Medical Services, EMS, is the pre-hospital team that will call ahead with vital signs and information about mechanism of injury. Mechanism of injury guides evaluation and raises or lowers the probability of certain injuries. Blunt versus penetrating trauma, specific considerations include speed of collisions, damage to vehicles, presence of blood at the scene, and other victims or fatalities. This information is used to prepare and anticipated interventions once they arrive. Occasionally, a special GO team is requested to assist in extrication in this case. This means the special team of doctors and nurses will be picked up and flown by medevac to the scene to help. Sometimes they are needed to amputate limbs on the scene to remove the victim from a crash and to save their life. Arrival. The most important first step in a major trauma is completion of the EMS handoff. Give the pre-hospital team silence in the room to give report before beginning the patient assessment. Immediate life threats will require immediate management and are often identified by the pre-hospital team. Primary survey. A goal is to find and address immediate life threats. Typical approach is the ABCDE mnemonic, standing for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Although often taught as dictating priority in order of assessment, example, airway before circulation, all components should be assessed in parallel. For speed and efficiency, a logical sequence of assessment to establish treatment priorities must be gone through sequentially, although with good teamwork, some things will be done simultaneously. Resuscitation procedures will begin simultaneously with the assessment involved in the primary survey. Example, life-saving measures are initiated when the problem is identified. Special account should be taken for children, pregnant women, and the elderly as their response to injury is modified. A. Airway. Maintenance. Cervical spine protection. Are there signs of airway obstruction, foreign bodies, facial, mandibular, or laryngeal fractures? Management may involve secretion control, intubation, or surgical airway. Establish a clear airway, chin lift or jaw thrust, but protect the cervical spine at all times. If the patient can talk, the airway is likely to be safe. However, remain vigilant and recheck. A nasopharynx airway should be used in a conscious patient or as a temporary measure of an oral pharyngeal airway in an unconscious patient with no gag reflex. Definitive airway should be established if the patient is unable to maintain integrity of airway. Mandatory if the Glasgow coma scale is less than eight. Cervical spine protection is critical throughout the airway management process. Movement of the cervical spine could cause a spinal injury, so movement of the cervical spine could be avoided unless absolutely necessary for maintaining an airway. The trauma mechanism or history may suggest the likelihood of a cervical spine injury, but always assume there is a spinal injury until proven otherwise, especially in a multi-system trauma or 
if there is an altered level of consciousness, inline immobilization and protection of the spine should be maintained and x-rays can be taken once immediately life-threatened conditions have been dealt with. The Glasgow Coma Scale. B. Breathing and ventilation. Provide high flow oxygen through a rebreather mask if not intubated and ventilated. Evaluate breathing, lungs, chest wall, diaphragm, chest examination with adequate exposure. Watch chest movement percus to detect lesions, acuity, impairing ventilation, tension pneumothorax, a flailed chest, a hemothorax, a pneumothorax. It can be difficult to tell whether the problem is an airway or ventilation problem, what appears to be an airway problem leading to intubation and ventilation may turn out to be a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, which will be exacerbated by intubation and ventilation. C. Circulation with hemorrhage control. Blood loss is the main preventable cause of death after trauma. To assess blood loss rapidly, observe level of consciousness, skin color, pulse, and bleeding. This should be assessed and controlled. IV access should be achieved with two large cannula in an upper limb. Access by cut down or central venous catheterization may be done according to, to, to skills available. And a cannula insertion, blood should be taken for crosshatch and baseline investigations. IV fluids will need to be given rapidly. Direct manual pressure should be used to stem visible bleeding. Transparent pneumonic splinting devices may control bleeding and allow visual monitoring. Surgery may be necessary if these measures fail to control hemorrhage. Occult bleeding into the abdominal cavity and around the long bone or pelvic fracture is problematic but should be suspected in the patient not responding to fluid resuscitation. C. Circulation with hemorrhage control continued. Note. Response to the blood loss differs in elderly. Limited ability to increase heart rate, poor correlation between blood loss and blood pressure. Children tolerate proportionately large volume loss, but then rapidly deteriorate. Athletes do not show the same heart rate response to blood loss. Chronic conditions and medication may affect response and early on in trauma management will not be known about. D. Disability. Neurological status. After A, B, and C, rapid neurological assessment is made to establish level of consciousness, pupil size, symmetry, reaction, any lateralizing signs, level of spinal cord injury, oxygen, ventilation, perfusion, drugs, alcohol, and hypoglycemia may all affect the level of consciousness. Patients should be reevaluated frequently at regular intervals as deterioration can occur rapidly and Often, patients can be lucid following a significant head injury before worsening, such as signs as a pupil asymmetry or dilatation, impaired or absent light reflexes. All weakness suggests an expanding intracranial mass or diffuse edema. This requires IV, mannitol, ventilation, and urgent neuro neurological opinion. Hypertonic saline can be used as an alternative to mannitol, especially in hypovolemic patients. E, exposure environmental control. Undress the patient, but prevent hypothermia. Clothes may need to be cut off, but after examination, attend to prevent heat loss with warm devices, warm blankets, etc. Also, check blood glucose levels. Additional considerations to primary survey and resuscitation. ECG monitoring. This can guide resuscitation by diagnosing dysrhythmias, ischemia, cardiac injury, pulseness electrical activity, PEA, which may indicate cardiac tamponade, hypovolemia, tension, pneumothorax, and extreme hypovolemia, hypoxia, or hypoperfusion should be suspected if there is bradycardia or urinary ga gastric catheters. The output of urine can guide fluid replacement, which reflects renal perfusion. Gastric catheters are inserted to reduce aspiration risk. 
suction should be applied. Other monitoring. Monitoring of resuscitation by measuring various important parameters of measures adequacy of resuscitation efforts. Values for various parameters should be obtained soon after the primary survey and reviewed regularly. Important parameters are pulse rate, blood pressure, ventilator rate, arterial blood gases, body temperature, and urinary output. Carbon dioxide detectors may identify dislodged tracheal tubes. Pulse ox measures oxygen hemoglobin. Remember, blood pressure is poor measure of perfusion. Diagnostic procedures. Care should be taken that these do not hamper resuscitation. They may be best deferred to the secondary survey. Modifications to the ATLS guidelines have been suggested. X-rays are most likely to guide resuscitation early on, especially in blunt, blunt trauma. Include chest X-ray, a pelvic X-ray. It has been suggested that CT scans may be used in some stable patients, a lateral cervical spine X-ray, and other useful procedures include FAST, focused assessment with sonography for trauma, and EAST, extended focused assessment with sonography for trauma, and or CT scanning to detect occult bleeding. Secondary survey. This begins after the ABCDE of the primary survey. Once resuscitation is underway and the patient is responding with normalization of vital signs, the secondary survey is essential head-to-toe examination with completion of the history, reassessment of progress, vital signs, etc. It requires repeat physical examinations and may require further x-ray and laboratory tests. It comprises of history, allergies, medication currently used, past illnesses and pregnancy, last meal, events, environment related to injury. Physical examination. This will repeat in some, at, some examinations already undertaken in the primary survey and will be further informed by the progress of the resuscitation. It aims to identify serious injuries, occult bleeding, etc. A review of neurological status, including GCS score, also undertaken. Back and spinal injuries are commonly missed and pelvic fractures cause large blood loss, which is often underestimated. Beware. Burns, fluid requirements, inhalation injury, cold injury, continue resuscitation until rewarmed, high voltage electricity injuries, extensive muscle injury likely to be concealed. Additional considerations to secondary survey. A range of further diagnostic tests and procedures may be required after the secondary survey. These include CT scans, ultrasound investigations, contrast x-rays, angiography, bronchoscopy, esophageal ultrasound, etc. Definitive care. Choosing where care should be continued most appropriately will depend on the result of the primary or secondary surveys and knowledge of the facilities available to receive the patient. The closest appropriate facility should be chosen. Records and legal considerations. Remember, keep meticulous records, times for all entries, etc. Teamwork with timekeeping and recording of clinical measurements and observations can be helpful. Some units have a member of the nursing staff whose role is to record and collate patient care information. Consent for treatment is not always possible with life saving treatment, and consent may have to be given later. Forensic evidence may be required in injuries caused by criminal activity. Practice tips. Regular training and resuscitation by the whole practice team is recommended. Attention to team approach is essential. Involvement in medical cover at schools, sports events, and care car accidents. British Association for Immediate Care Basics requires higher level training and regular refresher courses. With that being said, which first radiographic exam will be performed first? You got it, a chest x-ray. Chest pathology. Pneumothorax. A pneumothorax is an abnormal collection of air in the pleural space between the lung and the chest wall. How will the team rectify the situation for the patient? Chest tube. 
A chest tube is a flexible plastic tube that is inserted through the chest wall and into the pleural space or mediastinum. It is used to remove air, fluid, pleural fusion, blood, or pus from the intrathoracic space. Here is a picture of the chest tube and how it works. What is the second radiograph that we would take? Initial pelvis radiograph. What is the pathology here? Open book fracture. An open book pelvic fracture is a term used to describe any fracture that significantly disrupts the pelvic ring. These injuries combine an anterior pelvic injury causing a widening and opening of the pubic symphysis and a posterior fracture or ligamentous injury. Pelvic binder. Pelvic binders should be applied in suspected pelvic fractures with blunt or blast injuries and at least one of the following. Pelvic pain, any major lower limb amputation or near amputation, physical examination findings suggestive of a pelvic fracture, unconsciousness, shock, pelvic binders should be centered over the greater trochanters. Pelvic binder. This is early use of a pelvic binder. Pelvis radiographs in a pelvic binder. The one on the left, you can see it's an AP pelvis that is really keeping that pelvis together. And the one on the right, when the binder is loosened, you can see the open book fracture come apart. Second chest x-ray ordered. Central line placement. A central venous catheter, also known as a central line, a central venous line, or a central venous access catheter, is a catheter placed into a large vein. Catheters can be placed in veins in the neck region, groin, or through veins in the arms. Central line as seen here where the arrow is. Central line placement. This shows you as it comes down into the SVC of the heart. Immobilization devices. So an example of some cervical collars and a trauma mat that is used, used. Trauma splints that can be used that you may see. Backboards, different types and kinds that you may see. Warning, the next slide contains graphic photos. Sometimes you can't be splinted. These are some examples of some terrible fractures that have not been able to be splinted. And you have to figure out a creative way outside the box to x-ray them. This Second is Steve down. Carroll and you're listening to the EM Basic Podcast. From EM Today Basic we're going to be talking podcast. about trauma. Nothing gets the adrenaline flowing like a sick nicely. trauma patient, it's good but it's really important nice that we use that adrenaline in a positive way to keep focused and not lose control of the resuscitation. This is going to be a two-part episode. This episode will, will review the initial evaluation of the trauma patient, and the second part will focus on the interventions that we have to perform in the trauma bay. As always, this podcast doesn't represent the views or opinions of the Department of Defense, the U.S. Army, or the Shawshank EM Residency. So whenever we talk about trauma, the common language that we all speak is the language of Advanced Trauma Life Support, or ATLS. Just as a background on ATLS, it was started in 1978 by Dr. Jim Steiner, an orthopedic surgeon. He created this course after he crashed his small plane in Nebraska with his wife and children on board. His wife was killed instantly and several of his children were critically injured. They were taken to a local hospital where he was appalled by the lack of good trauma care. He set out to create a multi-day certification course that would teach healthcare providers the basics of trauma care so everyone can use the same playbook when it comes to trauma care. While I encourage everyone to take ATLS at some point, let me give a disclaimer. ATLS is not meant to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the cutting edge of trauma care. While ATLS has evolved over the years with advances in medical care, it is meant to teach the basics of trauma care. Some aspects of ATLS have lagged behind the times, 
most notably in the area of airway management. If you look through the ATLS manual or take an ATLS course, you'll notice that the section on RSI and airway management is not as robust as it should be. However, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't totally disregard the teachings of ATLS. ATLS is useful because it teaches us all to speak the same language and do the same basic things for each trauma patient. While most of what I talk about will have a basis in the ATLS guidelines, I will be going above and beyond those guidelines to give you the latest in trauma care. So let's get started. At this point, you're probably going to expect that we are going to start with the patient arrival and the ABCs, but the reality is that the trauma resuscitation starts when you receive notice that you're getting a trauma patient. This is when the EMS crew calls in and gives you the report on the trauma patient that you are about to receive. I'm not going to go into specifics of how to triage trauma patients over the phone, but you should have some protocol to determine which trauma patients are sicker than others. For example, a gunshot wound to the chest with hypotension should get a larger response from the trauma team than a patient from an MVC with stable vital signs. Be aware of any patient with a severe mechanism of injury or unstable vital signs or a low GCS in the field. A blood pressure of less than 90 systolic in the field is an independent predictor of increased mortality, so don't blow off hypotension. Next, before the patient arrives, you need to prepare the trauma bay and your team. While most trauma bays are set up to go at a moment's notice, there are a few things that you can do to prepare for the patient's arrival. If you don't have blood products in the trauma bay already and the patient is sick, then you need to call for blood products. If the patient has low GCS or is in respiratory distress, then you should prepare for RSI. Make sure all of your airway equipment is out and tested. I also like to have two yank hour suction catheters available tucked underneath the mattress before the patient arrives. I also like to have RSI medications drawn up ahead of time if I think I will need to innovate the patient based on the EMS report. You don't want to be wasting time by drawing up medications out of a vial when the patient is sick. I like to have at least 30 milligrams of Atomidate and 200 milligrams of succinylcholine drawn up ahead of time so it's ready to go. If you don't end up using the medications, it's not a big deal. Those are pretty cheap medicines. Now, I know that there is some grumbling out there that there are drug shortages in the U.S. for Atomidate and sucks, but a few wasted doses here and there are not going to deplete the entire U.S. supply of these medications. The next step is to make sure that your team is ready. Everyone needs a defined role in the trauma bay or chaos will ensue. At a minimum, you should have at least one nurse on one side of the patient, a tech or medic on the other side of the patient, a nurse to act as a recorder, and a provider who is running the resuscitation and performing the primary and secondary survey. Now, this is the absolute minimum staffing that you should have. The reality is, is that at an academic center, you will have a lot more help than this minimum staffing. At a trauma center, in addition to that minimum staffing, you will likely have another provider at the head of the bed to monitor the airway, a provider on each side of the patient to do the surveys and perform procedures, and a provider at the foot of the bed to run the resuscitation. This person is called the team leader. The point here is that before the patient arrives, you need to establish what each person's role is in the trauma bay. The team leader needs to take charge and tell each person what their role is in the resuscitation. It needs to be established ahead of time who will be running the resuscitation and who will be giving orders in the room. During the resuscitation, the team leader's voice should be the only voice in the room giving orders so that communication is clear and there aren't conflicting orders being given to the other team members. That team leader needs to stand at the foot of the bed and should not be involved in doing procedures on the patient or doing the primary or secondary survey. Their job is to run the resuscitation and oversee the entire resuscitation as a whole. If you are the designated team leader and you're prone to getting involved in patient care, then you should cross your arms and force yourself to not step beyond the foot of the patient's bed so that doesn't happen. So now let's move on to the patient's arrival. When the patient arrives, the team leader should quiet the room and allow for the patient to be transferred to the stretcher. This is the most important time to keep control of the room because this is where it can get out of hand. Now each trauma center has its own way of running a trauma resuscitation, so this will vary from institution to institution. What I will do here is go through how my center runs a trauma because I think it works and it's what I'm familiar with. At this point I should mention that everything that we do in the trauma bay is usually done simultaneously. While the primary survey is going on, there's usually a nurse getting an IV and a tech exposing the patient, among other things, 
So although this seems like a series of steps to follow, it's actually a fluid thing where multiple steps are accomplished at once. The first step of the primary survey is to accomplish the A, B, C, D, E of trauma care. That stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So before EMS report is even given, the patient should be transferred to the stretcher and the person at the head of the bed should start assessing the airway and the breathing. The easiest way to accomplish this is to ask the patient what their name is. If the patient can talk without difficulty, then you know that their ABCs are probably intact. In order to assess the airway, have the patient open their mouth and look for bleeding, broken teeth, or any obstruction to the airway. To assess the patient's breathing, listen for breath sounds on the anterior chest on each side. This is not a physical exam skills class. You don't have to listen to in all lung fields, just one place on each side. I prefer to listen somewhere in the pectoral area above the nipple so that you can get good lung sounds. What you are listening for is unequal breath sounds. If you hear decreased or absent breath sounds on one side, you have to assume that it's a pneumothorax and act appropriately. We will talk more about trauma bay interventions in the next episode, but the first step is identifying a pneumothorax. The next step in the ABCs is to assess the patient's circulation. Check the radial pulses on each side, and you can also check the femoral pulse and or the DP pulse in the feet if that's more accessible. You're just looking for a palpable pulse here and if they're equal on both sides. The next step is to assess the patient's disability, which is an extremely brief neuro exam. The first thing to assess is the patient's GCS. I'm not going to launch into a big review of calculating GCS here. Here's the quick and dirty way to calculate GCS in the trauma bay. If the patient is awake, talking, and not confused, they have a GCS of 15. If they are awake and talking, but they are confused, most likely from head injury, that's a GCS of 14. If the patient is comatose, not talking, and not moving, then they have a GCS of 3. If the patient is comatose and intubated, they have a GCS of 3T. If the patient had a depressed level of consciousness and is not following commands, then call a GCS of 8 and think about taking their airway. A difference of GCS between 8 and 10 in the trauma bay just doesn't matter, and you will spend more time calculating the GCS that you should be spending on the primary and secondary survey. Here's the bottom line for the patient between a GCS of 3 and 15. If you can't follow commands, then call it a GCS of 8 and move on. The second part of the disability exam is to make sure that the patient can move all their extremities and follow commands. Tell the patient to squeeze your fingers with their hands and wiggle their toes. You aren't looking for an exact motor strength exam here. What you're interested in is in that the patient can follow a command and that they can move their arms or legs. The final part of the primary survey is exposure of the patient. This is where the patient's clothes have to be completely removed and the patient's body needs to be completely exposed. This is often happening simultaneously with the rest of the primary survey by the techs and nurses, but it's important to make sure that the patient is completely exposed so that you find all the patient's injuries. Now you can use some discretion here. If this is a patient from a minor MVC, then you may not necessarily need to cut all their clothes off, but just be careful to do a thorough assessment and expose them completely at some point. So before we review the primary survey, there is one caveat to the primary survey that falls outside of the ABCDEs that I have learned as part of my military training. In combat, traumatic injuries tend to be a lot different from injuries on the civilian side. The vast majority of injuries during combat are made from high-powered weapons and explosive devices such as IEDs. These weapons tend to cause massive extremity injuries that can cause massive bleeding. In a lot of cases, a person can exsanguinate from massive extremity bleeding before you have time to control their airway and restore their blood volume. So in cases of massive extremity bleeding or amputation, before you even assess the airway, get a tourniquet on the injured extremity and tighten it down until the bleeding stops. This may save the patient's life, and it needs to be done quickly. Here's the interesting thing about tourniquets. When I took my EMT class back in 1999, I was taught that tourniquets are a method of last resort, only to be used after direct pressure and pressure point application. The concern was that you would cause ischemia to the limb that would make it unsalvageable. Now the pendulum has swung the other way, and now we're talking about using tourniquets first in serious extremity wounds. This is mostly from the military's experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
that has shown that tourniquets are safe, effective, and life-saving. In addition, the after-action report from the Virginia Tech shootings detailed how several lives were saved by application of tourniquets by tactical medics. The concern here used to be that these tourniquets are left on for hours, but most people are arriving at trauma centers within minutes, not hours. One last thing about tourniquets. If you apply them to a conscious patient, give them pain control and lots of it. I volunteered once to have a tourniquet tightened down on my forearm until I lost a pulse, and that was the most painful 30 seconds of my life. So make sure to give your patient lots of pain control if they're awake and you apply a tourniquet. So let's review the trauma bay preparation and the primary survey one more time. Be sure to gather your team, get your personal protective equipment on, and clearly define roles of each person in trauma bay. Prepare an ER assigned medicines that you think you may need, and call for blood products if you have to. For the primary survey, get the ABCDEs done. Ask the patient their name. If the patient is awake and they can tell you their name, then their ABCs are probably intact. Check their airway for patency, blood, or broken teeth. Next, assess the breathing with checking for equal bilateral breath sounds on the front of the chest. Next, check the patient's circulation by palpating distal pulses. After that, assess the patient's disability with a quick neuro exam. As far as a GCS, if the patient is awake and with it, they are 15. If they're confused and awake, they are 14. If they're comatose, they have a GCS of 3, 3T three if they're intubated. If they're awake but not following commands, call them a GCS of 8 and move on. Next, make sure to check that the patient can move their arms and legs. Next, be sure to completely expose the patient. Finally, address any life-threatening extremity hemorrhage immediately by applying a tourniquet and tightening it down until the bleeding stops. Once we are done with the primary survey, this is a good time to get the EMS report. Once you assess the patient's ABCs, you know that they are stable enough to take the time to hear the EMS report. Once you get the ABCs assessed, have the AMS crew give their report while the providers of the patient's side continue the primary and secondary survey. Make sure the room is quiet and that the EMS crew speaks loudly enough for everyone in the room to hear the report. This way, everyone hears the EMS report and we can pay better attention once we get the primary survey done. This helps the team get valuable information from EMS, and it tells the EMS crew that we are really listening to them instead of blowing them off. If the EMS crew starts the report as soon as they get into the trauma bay, then they will often be trampled on by people trying to get the primary survey done. So if you have the EMS crew delay the report until the primary survey is done, everyone wins. The next part of the initial resuscitation is the secondary survey. This is where we perform a complete head-to-toe exam and examine the patient for all their injuries. This can be accomplished immediately after a primary survey is done while the EMS report is being given. The most effective way to ensure that all exam findings are reported and the EMS report is understood is for each provider to mentally record the exam findings and announce them when prompted by the team leader. For example, let's say that you're doing that secondary survey and you find bruising on the abdomen. This finding doesn't need immediate intervention so you should continue the secondary survey and assess the rest of the patient without calling out your exam finding and interrupt the EMS report. When the team leader asks you for the secondary survey findings, report the abdominal bruising that you found. If you have a provider at the head of the patient's bed and one at the patient's right side, have the provider at the head of the bed assess the patient's HENT exam, while the provider at the patient's right side should check everything from the clavicles down. After that provider at the head of the bed does the primary survey, have that person quietly ask the patient their ample history. This is the patient's allergies, medications, past medical and surgical history, last meal, and events leading up to the event. Also ask the patient when their last tetanus shot was. Let's start with the HENT exam and work our way down. Start by assessing the scalp for any lacerations. Scalp lacerations can bleed a lot, so if you find one, Apply direct pressure with gauze and tape around the head. If the patient comes in with a bandaged head wound and the bleeding is clotted off, don't remove the bandages until you've completed the primary and secondary survey. You don't want that wound opening up again and start bleeding and have it get you distracted from other injuries. Get your primary and secondary surveys done before you take down that bandage and you're ready to deal with whatever bleeding that you find. Next, assess the patient's face. Press on the forehead the midface, and the jaw, noting any abrasions or lacerations. 
Next, get a notoscope or other light source and have the patient open their mouth. Take a really good look inside the patient's mouth and look for any bleeding, lacerations, or broken teeth. Next, check the nasal septum to make sure there isn't a septal hematoma. Next, check the ears for any bleeding or hem hemotympanum. It's really hard to assess the ear canals of a trauma patient in a C-collar, so just do your best. Next, check the patient's mid-face for stability. Press on the maxillary sinuses and press upwards on the patient's front upper teeth if they're awake and cooperative. Ask the patient if they feel like their teeth line up. If they don't, you should be concerned for a facial fracture. The next step in the HENT exam is to examine the neck. While someone else holds C-spine control from below, you should remove the C-collar and palpate the patient's posterior neck for tenderness. You also need to palpate the anterior neck, checking for any injuries and whether the trachea is midline. The next step of the secondary survey is to check the anterior chest, abdomen, and pelvis for injuries. Take another better listen to the lung sounds and palpate the chest wall for tenderness or injuries. Assess the abdomen for tenderness, rebound, or guarding. Make sure not to miss any bruising or abrasions on the abdomen. For the pelvis, you often hear people refer to rocking the pelvis, but don't do that. When you examine the pelvis, compress it in the anterior posterior direction, and then compress the pelvis inwards from each hip. Don't rock the pelvis side to side. If the patient actually has a pelvic fracture, you can cause shearing that can cause more bleeding. The next part of the secondary survey is to examine the lower and upper extremities. Methodically work your way down each leg and each arm, examining for any injuries. Recheck distal pulses for each extremity, and then make sure to check the axilla and groin for any injuries and not to miss anything. After the secondary survey is done on the anterior side, the next extremely vital part of the secondary survey is to roll the patient to the side. There are a lot of trauma, morbidity, and mortality conferences out there that were caused by the failure to roll the patient and discover all injuries. If you talk to anyone who has done trauma for a while, everyone will have a story about a hidden gunshot wound or stab wound that wasn't discovered because the patient wasn't rolled in a timely manner. So once the secondary survey is done on the anterior side, get the team all on the same page and log roll the patient. Make sure everyone knows which side you are rolling to the patient to and avoid rolling the patient towards the side of any known injuries. Get at least two people on the same side which you'll roll the patient towards to do the log roll. The person at the head of the bed should control the patient's C-spine and call out a 1-2-3 count to roll the patient so everyone is on the same page. Once the patient is rolled, examine the patient's back for any tenderness, step-offs, or deformities. Ask the patient to say yes or no if they have any tenderness and not to shake their head. Examine the entire back and look for any injuries. Now let's talk about the rectal exam. ATLS will tell you that the number one rule of trauma is fingers and tubes in all orifices. This is to make sure that you're being complete, but the reality is, is that a routine rectal exam is often unnecessary in the vast majority of trauma patients, and this is supported by the literature. Just follow your institution's protocol on this one. If you don't think the patient needs a rectal exam, then have the patient squeeze their butt cheeks together to make sure that they have good muscle tone in the rectal area. If you do a rectal exam, what you're looking for is gross blood on your finger or a decreased rectal tone. There are other exam findings that people talk about, like a high riding prostate in a urethral injury or bone fragments and pelvic fractures, but I'm convinced that no one in the history of mankind has ever truly felt a high riding prostate in the trauma bay. So the bottom line is to follow your institution's protocol on routine rectal exams on trauma patients. While you have the patient rolled on their side, the final part of the secondary survey is to examine the perineal area for injuries and the back of the lower and upper extremities. Make sure that you aren't missing any wounds in those areas. Before you roll the patient back to the supine position, have the x-ray tech place an x-ray underneath the patient to get a chest x-ray. At this point, you have completed the primary and secondary survey. The next step is to perform your necessary interventions and radiological exams. A lot of people include the FAST exam as part of the secondary survey, and I agree, but this episode is already running long, so we'll talk about the FAST exam in the next episode. So that's all I have now for the Trauma Part 1 episode. Stay tuned for a bonus section on a related topic, where I'll go over why it's important to get your patients off of the backboard as soon as possible. Check out the show notes for a simple guide to how to run the primary and secondary surveys. And as always, give me your feedback and drop me an email with any show topics. Until next time, this is Steve Carroll for the Basic Podcast, signing off.
Now it's time for the bonus section. For this one, I'm going to talk about the medieval torture devices that we also call backboards. Using a backboard was one of the first skills that I learned as an EMT, and on the surface it makes sense. If a patient might have a spinal injury, it makes sense to keep them as still as possible, and backboards seem to be the way to do that. However, backboards cause a lot of bad things as well, and I think we use them way too much. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I've recently posted about this, but I won't stir up that controversy now. What I will talk about is why it's important that you get your patients off the backboard as soon as possible. When a patient arrives to the ED, it is very important that you get your patients off the backboards as soon as they arrive. If you've ever been on a backboard, you know how painful and uncomfortable they are. They can cause pressure ulcers and skin breakdown and can compromise the patient's breathing. As humans, we aren't built to be breathing flat on our backs. We much prefer to be sitting upright at some sort of angle. If you are strapped down completely flat to a backboard, then you are fighting gravity to take a full breath. So as soon as the patient arrives in the ED, whether they are trauma activation or not, be sure to roll them off the backboard. You can leave the C collar on and make a decision later about whether you can clear it, but there is absolutely no reason to leave your patient on there for one minute longer. My take is that if you aren't removing the backboard with the EMS crew still in the room helping you, then you aren't doing it fast enough. There is absolutely no reason for the patient to still be on the backboard for more than a few minutes, but I've seen patients languish on the backboard for hours, and the excuse is that the ED doctor is too busy. I'm not sure why a doctor is required to roll the patient off the backboard. We teach everyone down to first responders and EMTs how to do a log roll, and there is no reason why three techs or nurses can't do this on their own. If I need to palpate the back later, we can always re-roll the patient, but keeping the patient on the backboard doesn't keep their spine any straighter or provide any medical benefit. It's just a way to lift them off the ground. In patients with diagnosed C-spine fractures, we don't keep them in the hospital for weeks on a backboard, so why do it for three hours in the ED? Once a patient is rolled off the backboard, you can also put the head of the bed up to 30 degrees. Just do it slowly, and if the patient has pain before 30 degrees, then stop. Leaving the patient supine in is a setup for respiratory compromise and pneumonias, and it's also uncomfortable. One more tip for the EMS providers out there. Let's say that you have a patient with a C-spine fracture at another hospital whom you are transferring to a trauma center in a C-collar. Your protocols may say that you need to put anyone in a C-collar on a backboard, but this is a situation where you may want to contact your medical command to get permission to transport the patient without a backboard, especially if it's a long transport. That backboard isn't stabilizing any more of their spine, so see if you can transport with just a C-collar and the patient's head of the bed up to 30 degrees. That's all I have to say on that topic. Maybe one day I'll rant more on the necessity of backboards in general, but until then, just make sure to get your patients off the backboard as soon as possible once they arrive in the ED. If you don't, I will hunt you down and strap you into a backboard and make you stay there for 12 hours, okay? That's it. Until next time, this is Steve Carroll for the EM Basic Podcast, signing off. The end.